We do have a very special guest today in Max Lucado, no stranger to Preston Wood. He's been, in, been here on numerous occasions. Uh, I'm so grateful for Max, not only on a personal level, Max, your friendship, uh, but just your impact, your influence for the name of Jesus around the world. He's been called America's pastor, and I don't debate that. He's ministered to so many people through his messages, so often translated in books. Um, there are, I don't know, hundreds of books by Max Lucado. And um, in fact, Jarrett Stevens, our teaching pastor, said last evening, uh, now this is a joke, this is a disclaimer, all right? But he said last evening, if you don't have a Max Locato book in your library, you may not even be a Christian. So, <laughs> well, good thing we're not saved by the name of Max or his books, but it, it, it is good that Max has communicated God's Word in such a, a personal way, uh, he's a word, he's, no, he's not a wordsmith, he's a word master. And to tell stories that warm our hearts and to bring truth in ways that it connects with people. So I was absolutely thrilled when Max wrote a book on prayer. It's called Before Amen. What do you say? What do you do before you say amen? And many of us struggle with prayer, including me. We all want to learn how to pray better. We, we come like the disciples and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and the Lord has taught us to pray. And uh, Max is able to get that out of the Word and help us understand it. I tell, I'm telling you, when you walk out of here today, you uh, will be a man, a woman of prayer. I do believe that in just what you are about to hear. Dina Lynn is here, his wife. Dina Lynn, would you stand up? Uh, we want to welcome you. Max, thank you for bringing Dina Lynn with you. Max, Max is, uh, you know, Max is a writer, obviously, but Max is a pastor. And for the past 25 years, has been the pastor of Oak Hills Church in San Antonio. And uh, he maintains his ministry there. And um, he has a shepherd's heart and the pen of a poet. And he has the heart of God. Max, thank you for coming here. Welcome to Preston Wood. God bless you. Let's welcome Max Lucado. Well, good morning, everybody. Boy, I love your pastor. He's, he's kind of rough on the golf course, though. He beats me. <laughs> but what a, what a good man. What a good man. So faithful, so strong. He and Deb have just been a rock-solid influence for millions of us around the world over the last decades. And we need more people like him, don't we? And Deb, we're thankful to God for Pastor Jack. I love this church. I do. I love everything about this church. Every person I meet from, you don't have any cranky members. I've never <laughs> met a church that doesn't have anyone who's grumpy. Oh, I, okay. I, I guess I need to talk to that person. Yeah, but, but still. <laughs> But uh, like Jack said, my wife, Deanlyn, and I have been uh, in San Antonio now since 1988 at the Oak Hills Church. I preached the, basically the first six months of the year, and then Randy Frazee uh, preaches the, the back half of the year, and that frees me up to write and travel a little bit. I'm so grateful to come here. I love being a Christian. I really do. I just, I love it. I, I love waking up with hope. I love uh, going to bed thinking, you know, God watched over me today. I love the thought that at any moment this version of history could be interrupted, that Christ could appear in the sky and there could be the loud trumpet blast and everything we're singing today by faith, we would sing by sight and we would make all those declarations and we'll be joined with him forever and the great call in the kingdom to come. I love the thought that every struggle of my life and every struggle of yours has a purpose. may not be pleasant, but there's a purpose. We can handle something if we know there's purpose behind it. I, I love the thought that nothing is beyond God's reach. No problem ever surprises him. There's never an occasion that he scratches his head and says, I just don't know what to do. <laughs> we do that, don't we? We do that. I love the thought that every sin that I have ever sinned is washed away, that I could not be more forgiven than I am right now, and neither could you. 
that if I'm better tomorrow, he's not going to love me more. If I'm worse tomorrow, he's not going to love me less. And that his love doesn't come and go. It doesn't ebb and flow. I love the thought that, that this life is just a vapor compared to what awaits us in the life that is to come. Isn't that great? You know, all of us know people who live with such burdens and, and live with such pain. And I believe that when we get to heaven, we'll look back and say, oh, but it was all so brief. Even, even the lifetime racked with misery and pain, even that person will look back and say, oh, now I see. Now I see. Now I understand. There was a purpose in that disease. There was a purpose in that struggle. There was a purpose in that plan. I believe that God is good. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Isn't it great just to, just to know that we're covered by God's grace and to, and to know that we're loved? To be a part of a church. To be a part of an organization, a living, vibrant organization that is, that is built by the King of Kings. You know, you're not a part of just a, a bowling league here. <laughs> this isn't Boy Scouts. I was a Boy Scout. I like Boy Scouts. But the, the church is empowered by the presence of Christ. And Jesus is building his church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Pastor Jack's not building the church. I'm not building the church. Jesus is. What a great thing to think we're a part of an eternal kingdom enterprise that will last forever. And what a great thing to think that we get to talk to God about everything and anything. But we need to be talking to God. These are scary times in which we live. Uh, I've been traveling a lot over the last two or three months, and it occurred to me just this last week I think, I think there's a sense of anxiety in our country that is akin, not quite to the level, but is pro approaching the level of 9-11. There's this, there's this panic in people, this edge. And, and I think part of the reason, you have your reasons, I think part of the reason is we've never faced fears like this before. These ISIS beheadings, it feels so barbaric, doesn't it? Like, what, where did this come? Are we living in a science fiction novel? Is this true? And then Ebola, and this is ground zero, isn't it, of, of the American version of the Ebola challenge. And, and that causes us all to be on edge. But we need to have, in this time of panic, we need desperately a people of peace. We need a people of peace because any organization that makes decisions based on panic makes poor decisions. Any family, any company, any church, any society that lives driven by panic makes poor decisions. And so every society needs its quorum of people of peace. And that's what children of God are. That's what you are. We are called to be people of peace in a society that freaks out. <laughs> Let others go crazy. Let others watch the news and stay awake with anxiety. We choose instead to be people of peace because we have learned to take our problems to God and to pray. I'm going to host a prayer service tomorrow night. I'd like to invite you to tune in. I've never done anything quite like this, but tomorrow night we have a pray first service online. It's not in a church building. It's simply in a studio, and it's really not on a television network. It'll just be online. You can log on to my webpage, maxlocato.com. People from all over the world are going to be logging in. We're going to pray about Ebola. We're going to pray about ISIS. We're going to give these problems to God. We're going to tweet out our prayers, Facebook our prayers, all that stuff that I don't quite understand, if I can be honest with you. But other people do. Uh, to think about that. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m., just a half hour, let's all just pray together. won't be any sermonizing, just praying, and I hope you'll think about being a part of that. Can I share with you my favorite joke these days? Okay, I have the microphone, so the answer is yes. <laughs> so this couple were celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. 30th wedding anniversary. He was 60 years old. She was 60 years old. And God was so proud of them, he got word to them, whatever you pray today, that I will do. So she said, oh, I've always wanted to go to the Caribbean on a cruise. Poof, just like that, two tickets appeared in her hand. And her husband looked and said, whoa, this is for real. And he said, you know, I've always wanted to be married to someone who's 30 years younger than I am. 
poof, he was 90 years old. Just like that. <laughs> you women could see that coming, couldn't you? Take that, buddy. I'm so grateful that my wife is with me today. I, I married up. I really did. I caught Deanlin when she wasn't thinking. I caught her on a bad day. We've been married 33 years. We have three daughters. Though our daughters are grown and out of the house, I still get nervous every time I see those three words that strike fear in every parent's heart. You know the words I'm talking about, don't you? Some assembly required. Those are the most frightening words any parent ever has to read. All we wanted was a gift, right? A toy for our kids. And now we've got this lifelong project. It requires a hammer and a screwdriver and a welding truck. <laughs> we set about this task of trying to make A fit B and C fit D and wondering if we can skip steps 15 through 50 all together. <laughs> and then there's always the problem of the missing piece. Have you ever had that happen? Where do those pieces go? Does anyone know? I do. The devil takes those. The devil has a team of gremlins, a demons that are trained to go into wherever one of those per toys are being assembled, and they sneak off with those little bit screws and bolts. And right now in purgatory, there is a warehouse where they have stored all of them. That's where they are. Some assembly required. It's true in life, just as it's true in toys. Maybe marriage licenses should be signed only after we've read those three words, some assembly required. A job applications should include that disclaimer, some assembly required. I think babies should enter the world from the womb with a toe tag. It says some assembly required. Life comes at us in pieces and sometimes life falls to pieces. And we're trying to get the pieces to fit. Are you right now trying to get the pieces to fit in any part of your life? Raise your hand if in some part of your life you're just trying to get A to fit B, C to fit D, just somewhere. That, yeah, good. Yeah, just about all. That guy who didn't raise his hand, I've got a sermon on honesty. <laughs> it is a good lesson. <laughs> we're all trying to get the pieces to fit. So what do you do when they don't? Where do you turn when they don't? When you can't get the schedule to line up, when you can't get the doctor's report to meet your hopes, when the pieces don't fit, where do you turn? Do you get angry? Do you get frustrated? Do you get drunk? Do you get even? Do you turn to, do you turn to prayer? I would like to say that all my life I've been very quick to respond in prayer. But quite honestly, I've struggled with prayer. In fact, I'll just confess it, I am a recovering prayer wimp. <laughs> there it is. When I sit down to pray, my thoughts zig and zag and zig again. I think of a million and one things I need to do except the one thing I sat down to do. Distractions form on me like mosquitoes on a summer night in Texas. I know some people who don't struggle to pray. They just get it. They are PGA, Prayer Giants Association. I'm PWA, Prayer Wimps Anonymous. <laughs> they would rather pray than sleep. I tend to sleep when I pray. Why do we struggle with prayer? Well, part of it is we tend to make it complicated. We talk about prayer places, prayer places postures, prayer languages, prayer shawls, prayer beads, prayer cathedrals, prayer patterns, pray, prayer lists, prayer this, that, and the other. And we make it somewhat, and, and we can almost leave the impression, well, what if I mispray? What if I bow when I'm supposed to stand? What if I raise my hands when I'm supposed to keep them down? What, what if I say a thee when I'm supposed to say a thou? Can I mispray? And then there's the problem of unanswered prayer. 
But I tried that, Pastor. Why keep tossing the longings of my heart into a silent pool? And then there's just the idea, why would God want to talk to me? I can't even get the cable company to call me back. (laughs) Why would God want to talk to me? And so we have these questions that circulate around. Sometimes we get the idea that, that there are certain people who are prayer people, and I'm not one of those people. Or there's a secret code to prayer, and I just haven't been given it. Oh, the paradox, the promise, the puzzle of prayer. Here's what helped me. I went through all the prayers in the Bible, and I realized that all of the prayers in the Bible, Old Testament and New, as far as I can tell, can be captured in one small prayer. And I use this prayer to guide my thoughts when I pray. Just six stanzas. And all the prayers of the Bible would fit under one of these six stanzas. Can I share it with you? See what you think. It's called the pocket prayer. It begins like this. Father, you are good. I need help. They need help. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. On my good days, that prayer is just circulating in my head, a bit like background music. As I'm driving through traffic, Father, Father, you let me call you Father. As I'm heading into a meeting, you're good. You're good. The situation may be bad. The weather may be bad. The economy may be bad. But you're good. You're shot through with goodness. Everything about you is good. I need help. I need help walking into a doctor's office or or heading into a meeting or even walking down the grocery store aisle way. Lord, I need help. I need help. And they need help. Look at these people, Father. Or my friends or my children, they need help. My president needs help. Our church needs help. But before I say amen, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every heartbeat. Thank you for every breath. Thank you for what hair I have left. Thank you. Thank you for being so good. In Jesus' name, by Jesus' power, at Jesus' invitation, because I'm a blood-bought child of the one true King. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I just keep that prayer working in my head. Uh, Now, I think for many of us, prayer is not so much a 40-day retreat or a two-hour pre-dawn session as it is this ongoing conversation that we have with God throughout the day. To pray without ceasing is to pray to live with an awareness of God, to have this sense of, can we say, unbroken communion with God in which we can always live with an awareness of God. Wherever we go, we actually live in an awareness we're in the presence of God, and we take the presence of God with us. That's why the Apostle Paul said, you're the fragrance of Christ. When you come into a room, you bring the very aroma of Christ with you because you're living with an awareness of Christ. You're you're an ambassador for Christ in in your cul-de-sac or in your series of cubicles. You're different because you're sensing the awareness of God. You have one foot on earth and one foot in the kingdom. You're you're, you're kind of living with this bi-level vision of life. And this communion is what sets you apart. It's not so much the eloquence of the prayer that makes prayer powerful. Prayer is powerful not because of the way we pray, but because of the one who hears. Does that make sense? If we ever cause the power of prayer to depend upon the prayer, we're sunk 
because number one, we don't know the secret code because there isn't one. And number two, because we all stumble and fumble with words. But if the power of prayer depends upon the one who hears the prayer, we have hope because have we not already discovered that God is good and he is our father? I think that's why there are so many simple prayers in the Bible. There's a great study for you someday. Just look at all the short, one-sentence, simple, bite-sized prayers in Scripture. One of my favorite is the one we're going to look at for just a few moments. It's the prayer of Mary, the mother of Jesus. For my nickel, stories that involve Mary, the mother of Jesus, appear far too seldom in Scripture. I think, who would understand Jesus more than Mary, the mother of Jesus? After all, she carried him in her womb for nine months. So when we have an opportunity to see a story that involves Mary, the mother of Jesus, we perk up. Now, this one, if you want to read it, is in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1 and 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Just one step down, one rabbit trail. Isn't it great that Jesus was invited to a wedding? Isn't it great that he was likable enough that somebody said, don't forget to put Jesus' name on the wedding list? And isn't it great that Jesus came? that he stopped everything he was doing. Apparently, he loves to go to parties. <laughs> and so he made the long walk from Galilee up to Cana, and he brought with him his disciples, 12 or so friends. Maybe the fact that he brought these disciples is the reason they had the problem that they had. Because when they reached the wedding and the wedding began, this problem surfaced. And the wedding problem was simply what? They have no wine. Mary came to Jesus in verse 3. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. I would suggest to you that that is a prayer. That is a prayer. It is a request. It is a simple request. It is a four-word request in English. They have no wine. On a scale of one to ten, one being basic, ten being eloquent, how would you rank that prayer? Would you want to frame that one and hang it on a wall? <laughs> That's a very simple statement. There's not much to it. It's just simply a statement of a problem. She doesn't come to Jesus and tell Jesus how to fix the problem. She's not bossy. She's not demanding. She doesn't over-spiritualize the problem. She doesn't say, now, if you were really the Son of God, we would never have a problem. She doesn't get all kind of wound up in it. She doesn't even say, now, I'm your mother. You have to do this. She doesn't play any, any clout, doesn't have any power move on him. She simply says, here's a problem. And she takes the problem and she presents it to Jesus. Now, here's an idea. What if we learned a lesson from Mary? Remember that problem we talked about where A doesn't fit B, the pieces don't fit? What if before you allow that problem to get to you, you get that problem to Christ? What if the minute you have a problem, you do what Mary did? You put it in a sentence, you walk it across the room, and you present it to him. The power of a simple prayer. What if you were never meant to carry your problems by yourself? What if the reason that we get so tired is because we try to carry burdens we were never intended to carry? Now, because Mary took the problem to Christ first, we have what has to be one of the most interesting conversations in the Bible. Look what Jesus says in response. Jesus says to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, 
whatever he says to you, do it. I didn't see that coming, did you? Jesus says, what does this concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. It seems that Jesus did not go to Cana with the intention of performing a miracle. He did not go to Cana with the purpose of displaying his ability. He had yet to perform a public miracle. Apparently, he went to Cana just to go to the wedding. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes and presents a problem to him, and he says initially, well, my hour has not yet come. This was not a part of my plan. This could be, in some ways, considered the first prayer presented to Jesus in Scripture. I mean, the very first one. And initially, Jesus is hesitant. As sometimes we take our prayers to Christ and we don't sense an immediate response. We wonder, is he listening? So what did Mary do? Did she point at her watch and say, come on, come on, hurry, hurry. I need a response today. No, look what she did. This is very helpful. Mary, having taken the problem to Christ, Jesus having said, my hour has not yet come, Mary left the problem with him, turned to the servants and said what? Whatever he says. Whatever he says. Did she know what Jesus was going to say? No. As far as she knew, Jesus was not going to say anything. Correct? She literally left the problem with him. Whatever he says, that's what I want. Prayer is not so much asking God to do what I want. Prayer is asking God to do what is right. Prayer is not so much asking God to do what I want, though it is that he is our Father, so we can come to him with our requests. But prayer is even more saying, but Lord, what you want is what I want. It's an exercise in trust. It's really a form of worship, isn't it? It's a declaration of faith. Do you think Jesus was mad at Mary, upset with Mary? I don't think so. I think he was pleased with Mary. The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. Mary came in faith, so he was pleased. So much so that he responded to her request, even though initially he had raised an objection. Look what he did. Jesus said to the servants, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they do. They fill the water pots to the brim. They take some out. They take the water to the master of the feast. Somewhere in route between water pot and master of the feast, that H2O becomes Bordeaux. <laughs> I thought that was clever. <laughs> And he tasted the wine. And what did he say? He said, wow, this is really good stuff. Who does this? Typically, people serve the good wine at the beginning of the wedding. But here you saved the best of the wine until the end. Most people just serve their good. And then at the end, we all get that convenience store, Mad Dog 2020. But here... <laughs> You're wondering how a preacher knows about Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> I told you I'm saved by grace. <laughs> uh, isn't he good? The wine was delicious. When Jesus answers a prayer, it puts a good taste in our mouth. It's just pleasant. It's not forced. It's just delightful. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Rose of Sharon. 
He loves to do good things for his children. Even if it means helping them enjoy the party a little bit more. How kind of our Savior. And not only is the quality of wine noted, the quantity of wine is noted. Six water pots filled how, far, how high? To the brim, overflowing. Now, a little math reveals that six water pots revealed to the, I'm sorry, filled to the brim results in water becoming 903 bottles of wine. You didn't know that, did you? 903 bottles. He could have filled a wine cell. He could have started a wine store. When Jesus answers a prayer, not only is it tasteful and delightful, it is abundant. It is abundant. And there is a blessing, not just for the one who offered the prayer, but for all those in that circle. Hmm. What good news for your company? What good news for your school? What good news for your neighborhood? What good news for your family? When you take your problems to Christ first, they're going to be blessed. There is a cascading result that's going to flow down upon them, even those who had nothing to do with the offering of the prayer. The whole circle of people gets blessed. The whole society gets blessed because there is somebody in that situation who says, I'm going to take the problem to Christ first. We can only wonder what our country would be like if every time a problem surfaced, we all said, okay, let's just all as a country go talk to Christ. I think that would create just such an overflow of kindness and goodness in this world. But since we can't force everybody to do it, what do we do? We do it ourselves. We can do that. That's the role of the church. We are the salt. We're the light. We keep bringing the problems to Christ first. And we say, Lord, would you please help? And he does. He does. Now, here's a good question. At least I think it's a good question. What caused Christ to do this? What prompted, what triggered his activity? Anyone? The request of Mary. Do you think Jesus knew that there was a paucity or a lacking of wine prior to Mary bringing the problem to him? Do you think he knew? I think he created the heavens and the earth. I, I, I kind of think he knew. Right? But what prompted his action? A simple four-word request prompted the action. There are certain things that we can never change through prayer. I get that. We cannot change the character of God. He will always be good regardless of our prayers. We cannot change the general scheme of history. There will always be dispensations. There will be a judgment day. There will be a heaven. There will be a hell. We will always need a Savior. We will always need forgiveness. We'll always need grace. So there are certain elements that are fixed in eternity. They, those cannot be changed. But there are other things that I like to call the lower story, kind of down here on earth, that when we pray about it, heaven responds. And we literally can cause there to be wine where there was no wine or hope where there was no hope or healing where there was just but sickness or answers where there was but confusion or peace where there was but just problems. Why? Because we are the children of God. <laughs> Not because we're eloquent. And not because we've cracked a code, but because we're blood-bought. We've been bought by God himself, and we are being trained to reign with him forever in the new kingdom. And he wants a relationship with us. And part of the relationship is this on-the-job training called prayer in which we ask God for, we make our requests, and sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says not yet, but we learn as we walk with him. He's waiting for us to come. He's waiting for us to come. I would dare say that you have the highest privilege of any person on our planet because you can talk to God about anything, 
in the name of Jesus Christ. That is to say, by the authority of Jesus Christ, not by your authority or mine, but by his authority. When you come to him, there is a response in heaven. And because you speak to him, your world is going to be different. Wasn't it it different in Mary's situation? And all she did was bring the problem to Christ. Okay, let's try it. You want to try it? Let's give a problem to Jesus right now. That problem, when I said, is there a part in your life where the pieces aren't fitting? Let's follow Mary's imitate. Let's imitate Mary's response. Let's take the problem to Christ. Please put your hands out in front of you. Take that problem and just mentally place it in your hands. Maybe you can reduce it down to a phrase or two like Mary did. She said, they have no wine. You might say, I have no patience. Or, or my arthritis is flaring up. Or I'm afraid about my grandchildren. Just anything. If it matters to you, it matters to God. You're his child. Okay, so here we go. Father, you are good. We need help. Now let's lift these up. Okay, let them go. Lower your hands. You don't face that problem by yourself anymore. You're not alone with that problem. It's not just up to you. That burden's not on your shoulders. You have given that burden to the burden bearer, Jesus Christ. Something supernatural just happened. It did. In the name of Christ, by his authority, you did what he asked you to do, and that is bring your burdens to him. You imitated Mary. You brought the burden to him, and you left it with him. You say, well, okay, Max, what's going to happen next? Hey, that's out of my pay grade. <laughs> okay. But we've been around the block enough to know this. Something is going to happen. It really is. Will it happen as quickly or dramatically as you want? Again, I don't know. I hope so. I do. But I do know the right thing will happen. So you can at least be relieved of the anxiety that nothing is going to happen or that it's all up to me or I've got to fix it. Here's what you need to do. You need to now live in faith. Something good is going to happen. Something good is going to happen. One of my friends said he grew up every day with his dad waking him up saying, time to get out of bed. Something's good going to happen today. I love that because we tend to get out of bed saying, oh boy, something bad's going to happen today. <laughs> but now something good is going to happen because God loves you because you've given the problem to him. So you can live in expectation of an answered prayer. Okay. Rather than live in dread of a problem, now you live in expectation of an answered prayer. How will he answer the prayer? Well, it may be answered before you go to bed tonight. It may be answered before you leave the auditorium today. There may be a person in the pew in front of you who has a solution to your problem. Maybe, right? It may take some time. Maybe part of the answer to prayer is not what you've prayed. Maybe God is wanting to teach you some patience or some trust. Or maybe he's using your challenge as a testimony to strengthen someone else. We don't know. We are not privy to all of God's ways. But we are certain of his goodness. And so we have left our problem with him. Every time you have a problem this week, would you do what you just did? Every time. Every time, whether great or small, would you take that problem and would you give it to Christ? Would you? You say, well, Max, if, if, I, if I give, if every time I have a problem, I take it to Christ, I'm going to be talking to Christ all day long. <laughs> the Apostle Paul says this, don't worry about anything. Someday in my life, I want to go through one day and obey that command. <laughs> don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs. Don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, 
which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and hearts quiet and at rest. There's the picture of the faithful Christian. Quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. An unprayed for problem is like an untreated thorn. I grew up in West Texas where I got thorns all the time. Played outside barefooted like other boys, and I'd always get stickers. And I learned early, once you get a sticker or a thorn, the first thing to do is to take it out. I'd go to someone who had tweezers. Because the longer the thorn stays, the higher the odds of infection. An unprayed for problem is like an untreated thorn. You let that problem get buried, buried down in your soul, it's going to get toxic. And what is small today is going to be poisonous tomorrow. Don't take your problems to the bar. Jim Beam cannot fix them. Really. Don't take your problems to Internet pornography. That won't solve the issue. Don't take your problems out on your kids or your wife or your husband. That only complicates matters. Take them quickly to Christ. Just say, Father, you're good. I need help. I know I was just talking to you 10 minutes ago, but I'm back again. I need help. <laughs> I know I did. I, I bother, can I bother you one more time? I just need help. And, and, and if you're like me, when you give the problem to Christ, within five or six minutes, you'll be reaching up and trying to take it back. You just pull your hand down and say, well, no, no, I gave that one to Christ. I gave that one to Christ. There is a new version of you waiting to be seen. There, there is a peaceful version of you just waiting to be hatched. You're going to learn to live in prayer. I just declare that over you. You're going to learn to live in prayer, to live in peace, to walk in faith, to be supported by the presence of God. There's a Boy, there's a beautiful chapter of your life that's just about to be written, and I'm so happy for you. Would you just walk in that type of faith today? I conclude with this story, what I think is just such a remarkable story, of a missionary by the name of Dr. Helen Rosevere. She was a missionary in the Congo for 20 years. During her fourth year in the Congo, serving at a medical clinic, there was a baby born prematurely, and the mother died in childbirth, leaving behind this baby as well as a two-year-old sister. Dr. Rosevear had no access to electricity, hence no incubator, no way of keeping the baby warm. But they did have a hot water bottle, but when the midwife tried to fill it up, it burst. She instructed for the midwife to sleep with the baby to keep the baby warm, and the next day she woke up with the problem on her mind. Dr. Rosevere mentioned the problem to some of the children who lived in a nearby orphanage. And one of the girls, a 10-year-old girl by the name of Ruth, said, well, let's talk to Jesus about it. And years later, Dr. Rosevere still remembered the prayer of faith prayed by 10-year-old Ruth. Ruth prayed, please, God, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow as the baby will be dead. Please send it this afternoon. And while you are at it, would you please send a doll for the little girl's sister so she'll know that you really love her? Dr. Rosevere was stunned. In order for that prayer to be answered, there would have to be the arrival of a parcel that afternoon. In her four years in the Congo, she had yet to receive one single delivery. Besides, who's going to send a water bottle, a hot water bottle, to the equator? Well, someone did. That afternoon, a truck pulled up into the entryway of the medical clinic. A delivery man brought a box to the porch of Dr. Rosevere's cabin. Dr. Rosevere stepped out, and here came all the kids to see what was in it. And as she began to tear away the paper, she opened it up, and there was some dried fruit. There were some jerseys. There were some books. And down at the bottom of the box, who would have thought there was a hot water bottle 
and next to the hot water bottle, a baby doll. That box had been packed and shipped by a Sunday school class somewhere on the East Coast five months earlier and just arrived that day. May God hear your prayer and respond that dramatically. May he do so. And he may. He is a good God. If he doesn't respond as quickly and dramatically as you want, that's okay. It's up to him now. Whatever he says, that's what we want. Amen. So you just leave that problem with him. And who knows? <laughs> By the time you go to bed tonight, you may be raising a glass of wine to toast the disappearance of a problem.